Vibrant, we are so glad that you've tuned in with us today. We're going to be continuing our next level podcast discussion after the message. Uh, we're hearing today from our growth pastor, Zach Garrett, and we've got with us our York Haven campus pastor, Carl George, and I'm Jamie Robinson. I'm the online campus pastor, and it is our joy um, to be sharing with you today. We're going to be talking with Zach about the book, The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. If you aren't familiar with Vibrant, we're located in central Pennsylvania area, and we have services in two locations, Mechanicsburg and York Haven, and we also have have services online, you can check us out at livevibrant.com. So we want to dive into this. So Zach, what made you choose the book, The Great Divorce? You know, I feel like the content of The Great Divorce is something that even in times whenever I've preached, um, pastored a church for two years, it just wasn't a topic that readily is available that I get to speak on, the reality of heaven and hell. Um, and so Drew asked, you know, from each of us, can you give me two or three books that are your favorites that you potentially like to speak from? And so I know I, I gave him this one and Ruthless Trust by Brennan Manning. I can't remember what the third one was. Not really expecting to get the green light for the great divorce, but Drew said, hey, um, I know this is one of your personal favorites. Um, just because like I shared during the message how it helped me find my way out of a crisis of faith. Um, when somebody posed to me the question of how, how can you believe in a loving God when he sends people to hell? And then this book just really brought the true question for me of why do people choose hell over a loving God? And finding that and then scripturally the basis for that being really the, the correct orientation and how we understand heaven and hell um, has made this book very near and dear to me. And then one that I thought could also be important for people to read is I think everybody kind of struggles to grasp the reality of hell and, and how, how that came to be and why people are sent there and, and just that being um, prevalent in their faith and their understanding of salvation. One of the things that you shared in your message that I thought was super helpful uh, was kind of taking that question and like flipping it upside down. You said um, mm -hmm. like a, the question we tend to ask is why would God um, send anyone to hell, but you actually said, why would anyone choose to separate themselves from a loving God? And I thought, I mean, that was really, um, powerful to consider. Um, do you want to like unpack that a little bit more for us? Yeah. Using the, the true life account there in, in Matthew 18 of the rich young ruler. And there's just true example of where Jesus was giving him the opportunity to surrender everything. Like I said, it takes two hands to carry your cross. Um, not leaving one hand on his wealth and, and one hand to grasp salvation. But Jesus said, you need to leave all of this behind, not because he's calling all of us to sell all of our possessions, but because his wealth was his God um, to lay down his idol so that then he could go. Jesus says, and then after you've done this, sell everything and give to the poor, then come and follow me. That was the moment right there that he had. And, and not to say that he didn't have moments later. But there it was, Jesus saying, I'm giving you this opportunity now. Come follow me. And the rich young ruler became sad because he was a man of great wealth and he couldn't give that up. And there is a, 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 a true example of someone who chose um, to separate themselves from God versus following Jesus. You know, that, that scripture says that Jesus loved him, looked at him and, and loved him. And I think there was something mm -hmm. about the young man's question that really – drew Jesus to him. There's an awful lot of people that they could care less about that question. They really don't care. It's not an issue in their life. So what has God done to draw them into this conversation? People that hell is not even on their radar because they don't care about heaven or hell. But what would you say God is doing to reach their, them with, with the truth that you've shared in your sermon? I think maybe part of that is for the call for preach because we are the ambassadors of Christ. God has given us the responsibility to to proclaim his goodness and to bring him glory to the people. And so I think part of that, Carl, that's a great question, is for pastors to be willing to speak on the reality of sin and its consequence and the need for Jesus to be our Savior. And when we, as pastors, fail to teach on that, and kind of like what I said then, uh, the heresy of love wins and everybody goes to heaven, that just dramatically changes the landscape of the church. 
it, it, it removes the, the call for repentance uh, to, to die to yourself and to become new in Christ Jesus, uh, to understand him as our atonement um, and sacrifice for sin. And that in order to, to have that, it's... What you're saying is it, it's the same thing he did for that young man. He, he calls us to repentance as he was calling that young man to repentance. It just may be in a different area of life. Is, is that what I'm hearing you say? But how do you call somebody to repentance if they don't understand that there's something to repent from? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think pastors can't be afraid to, I know it steps on toes. And then I, and I, and I, and I said, well, you can't serve both. As Jesus said, you can't serve both God and money, but that's God and sex, God and alcohol, God and patriotism, God, and whatever it is that is controlling your heart and binding your hands saying you got to lay that down because that's exactly what jesus called the rich young ruler to do you can't you can't have both you can't serve two masters and so just being willing to speak into people's lives in a way that it brings conviction um conviction isn't something that's bad and it's often a powerful tool and as i said fear is a powerful tool but only takes us so far and I don't think fear is what brought that poor widow to the point where she put all that she had into the, I think that was love. And so fear at some point has to give way to, um, and I, I gave this example, you know, some people may go into dating um, out of fear of being alone, but ultimately that fear of being alone should at some point transition to, I love this person. I love being with them. I love how they make me feel and how I can make them feel. And then that becomes a relationship that may turn into a marriage. And while fear um, may be a reason why somebody comes to church for, for the first time um, or wants to talk about baptism, ultimately, like I said, the Christian life isn't about what we're escaping from. It's about what we're going to. Mm. And um, our relationship with Jesus isn't about getting away from hell. It's about coming to know him and the life that he desires for us to have, life in the fullest. I love that. That's like one of the things I love about Vibrant because um, we're all about, you know, that Christ has come that we may have life. And um, mm -hmm. so many people think that that just means, okay, like I get saved and now like I just wait for heaven. Um, but God mm -hmm. wants to be at work in us now. And he is like a yeah. surgeon bringing a scalpel and he's transforming us into his likeness so that we can really experience life that God has for us, but also have purpose and mission um, to reach other people so that they can experience the same thing and have that relationship with God. I love, 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 love that idea. Well, and it just goes to that lie that I addressed that what we have now and, and we being in a sinful state when we've not surrendered to Jesus, when we're living for worldly things, that lie that what I have now is better than what I will find when I surrender everything to follow Jesus. I know I, I grew up thinking, gosh, Christianity's so boring. Like you don't get to do all the fun things of life. Uh, but as I've grown up, I've realized that those fun things of life are empty and they leave people longing for something that they aren't finding. And there's no joy there. There's no true, uh, the, ha the happiness is fleeting. The contentment is fake. And that's not what the kind of, that's not the kind of life that I want to live. Um, I want to be fulfilled and have the fruits of the spirit. And I, and I guess I get all that to say that I've realized that that Christian life, while it may appear born in the worldly standard, it's the life that brings fulfillment and true peace and joy. Well, Zach, um, in your, in your uh, sermon, you refer to the fact that God loves everybody and God is drawing everybody to himself. And we know through scripture that God draws people through creation. God draws through pe people to himself through the church. Can you talk a little bit about the role of the Holy Spirit in drawing people of all types to himself and how he desperately wants to, to reach all people and how his Holy Spirit is involved? Yeah, wow, that's a that's a, a big question. I think what my mind first goes to is what Paul talks about in First Corinthians, that it is the Holy Spirit that reveals to us the wisdom of God. Um, and so I think then there comes the wisdom of sin, the wisdom of the need for salvation, which brings about then the conviction for repentance, um, confession and, and baptism. And again, I think this is where, where truth prevails and where the enemy would have us be ashamed or, 
or bashful about proclaiming the truth. And again, that's the you can't really have the truth of salvation unless people understand what they need to be saved from. That in their current state, in their current life, there's condemnation, but Jesus desires to bring us salvation. Well, why do we need salvation? Why do we need atonement for sin? And so I can see a big, uh, you know, the big role of the Holy Spirit here is revealing the wisdom of God, this knowledge into their hearts. But there's a lot of people have a a lot of knowledge, but they don't have any wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge well applied. And so it's understanding then... um, the consequence of sin, the reality of hell, and then thus that bringing them to the point of what I think of the day of, okay, the day of Pentecost. Before then, Jesus had spoken in parables uh, to the Jews. They didn't understand what he was teaching, and it wasn't, to, it wasn't the right time for it to be revealed to them who Jesus was. He said that himself. That's why he then later um, unplugged the, the parables to his disciples and so that they could understand but it wasn't time for the Jews to understand. He still had to be crucified. But on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, and then here's Peter preaching this, this incredible sermon. And then by the thousands, the Jews, even though Peter said, you killed him, they're like, they were cut to the heart. And they said, okay, what must we do? And it was almost like then that Holy Spirit rained upon them the wisdom of the reality of the moment of who Jesus was while his um, his death and resurrection was fresh. Um, the Holy Spirit was new. And they heard this message in a different way that they had heard before, and it cut them to the heart. And it says 3000 were added to them that day. And so I think for a lot of people, it's just working through uh, the, the, the whoever's teaching the scriptures and revealing to them the wisdom that is found there that brings about actions of faith. So, Zach, I have no doubt that you left some things on the cutting room floor. <laughs> um, when you were writing your message, if you um, could have talked for five more minutes, um, you know, what would you have shared um, that was really helpful for you as you just kind of read through C.S. Lewis's writings in this book? Mm. I, I would say what, what you're struck with more than anything, and even how to explain the narrative of The Great Divorce, it's, it's just really a book you have to pick up. But it's it's all these different situations. And let me say this about The Great Divorce. I don't necessarily agree with all of the different um theology that he puts in there about the idea of ideas of afterlife and and purgatory and there being a vacation from purgatory um and and i would say that even c.s lewis would say this is open-handed he's not saying that this is dogma that you have to absolutely believe this but he's really going more for the moral and the principle in the story and he's using some of these um you know again if you're if you're catholic you'll you'll much more identify with the idea of purgatory but there's other Um, denominations that don't really believe that in being a part of of the afterlife. But all that to say, what he's getting after is that we we are the ones who lock ourselves in hell. And uh, and you read all these different accounts of different people for different situations. And the word that just keeps coming to mind is it's pride. Mm. It's this I deserve, I should have, I earned. It's because of what I've done. And truly to accept Jesus, you have to humble yourself, admit your sin, and realize that. And this is what Jesus said, again, in response to the rich young ruler is, is why do you call me good? There's no one good except God. It's because he's saying, how do I inherit? Well, we, you inherit by being good, but unfortunately, there's no one good. It's Jesus' righteousness that becomes our own. That is our way to salvation and it's complete humility and the absence of pride that only then do we accept i deserve nothing but hell but wow god out of your grace do i get what i do i get what i don't deserve and out of your mercy i'm not getting what i do deserve and it's that absence of pride um and this willingness to humble yourself before god that that brings about um that brings about the heart to accept Christ and his offering of salvation. Some of that I didn't really, I don't know, maybe I expounded upon it well enough, but I don't know that I did was the, the danger of being legalistic about this and the not being of the heart of how much is enough, 
but the desire of going, how much can I give? And I think there's this fear that if I start asking how much can I give, that I'm going to be way out of balance. I'm going to abandon my family. My marriage is going to fall apart. But if I could encourage one thing, it's when you ask God, how much can I give? He's never going to lead you down the wrong path in that. Mm, amen. I believe that when I surrender as much as I can to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, I'll be the best husband, the best father, the best pastor, the best friend I can possibly be. But there's this, there's this caution that's, I don't, I, it's not godly that goes, Ooh, but if you give God everything, you'll get out of balance. And, and, and again, all these things will fall apart. You, your kids will miss you. Like I actually believe that, that pastors who have chosen church over their family. And, and I'm, I'm very aware of this and very mindful as, as a pastor myself with kids, um, that that was not of God. That I really believe that in putting God first, everything balances exactly how it should. Um, and it's all about that relationship, that desire to serve the Lord, but also to listen and to be at his feet and to just let him lead your life. And knowing that when you fully surrender and every day with two hands, you're picking up your cross and following Jesus. That question of how much God can I give? He'll reveal that and it'll be beautiful and it'll be perfect. Um, and you don't have to stress about it being too much. I don't think we can ever give too much. So Zach, um, if somebody's thinking about reading The Great Divorce, who do you think this book is really going to be helpful to? One, I think this book, okay, admittedly, it's it's very abstract. So if you're not familiar with reading some of the older uh, English authors, it can be a little bit of a tough read. And it, I think even second service, I said, this is a book that you kind of need to read through a couple of times to really grasp. So if you're a patient reader, um, if you're looking for a quick, easy application, it's just, it's just plainly there. You might struggle with this book, but if you've ever read Chronicles of Narnia or screw tape, screw tape letters, or again, you're familiar with kind of that um, early middle 20th century kind of writing style. Um, I think you'll be able to understand what C.S. Lewis is grasping at with this. I say for anybody who has really kind of struggled with Calvinism and free will, um, with Reformed theology, or or do we have the opportunity? And, and I, I clearly addressed that during the message, that I believe that everyone has the opportunity, but not everybody will choose to accept Christ. Um, and so that and that, that invitation was, um, you know, if you struggle with that kind of theology, those interpretations of Scripture, I'd love to talk with you about that. Let's search the Scriptures open-mindedly and hear each other out. Um, and so C.S. Lewis is definitely going to make a case for um, why hell cannot be valid unless there's self-choice, that we put ourselves there. So if you're kind of going, yeah, I've, I've always kind of wrestled with the idea of Calvinism and Arminianism. This can also be a good book, not that it's going to give you any scriptural foundations that's not what he was going after there but he's going to put some ideas in your mind that that was the idea for my sermon sunday was okay here's the idea let's scripturally back this up because one thing i said very specifically because they're kind of both they're on the opposite ends of the spectrum i don't care if you're c.s lewis or if you're rc sproul if the theology being taught doesn't clearly align with scripture that nobody should ascribe to it and I wanted to make sure and take the time that while there isn't any direct biblical references in this book, I believe biblically it is founded. So um, I don't think I answered the question, but if you're really wrestling with so what's called soteriology, um, understanding of salvation, and uh, how is it that people then would be in hell, this is, this is a good book that will give you some foundational thoughts that then can be expounded upon in Scripture. Thanks, Zach. So if you yeah. you got questions about uh, salvation and hell and heaven and who gets in and who doesn't, this is going to be a good mm -hmm. book for you to read and discuss with Zach. <laughs> yeah. Well, and even just how you said that, I think because it used to be, well, wait, who gets in and who doesn't? Um, even that can be, and I'm not seeing Jamie, that, that's your thought behind yeah. it. Um, but it's not, it's not who gets in, it's who chooses to be there. Yeah. And I, I, I just think that that mindset is so pivotal um, and that people need to own that, that those who seriously desire joy and life in Christ, they're not going to miss it. It's not going to be about, oh, am I, am I going to squeak in or not? Is God going to choose me? It's no, 
did you choose God? Mm -hmm. Did you choose to take Jesus at his offer? And for those who um, God is a God of justice, and I don't believe that anybody is that who ends up in hell is going to go, this isn't fair. No, no, God will make it perfectly plain. And then he will, I, I believe that everybody who's there will go, yeah, you're right, God. I did choose this. This is where I chose to be. I put myself here because God is fair. He's good, but he's also just. I like how that comes back around. Um, you know, that so many of us just want to be like, well, why does God send people to hell? But nobody wants to be like, well, why didn't I choose God? Um, mm. You know, so it's kind of cool to kind of bring those two together. Well, Zach, we just want to thank you again for sharing with us. Carl, it was great to have you on the call. And uh, we hope that this series is really helpful for you in growing in your faith and in your, in your walk with God. Um, if you didn't get to check out any of our earlier episodes, you can go to livevibrant.com slash next level. And also a fun thing I want to make sure we point out is we are giving away two free copies of each book every week. And so uh, we just pulled the names of two people that are going to get winning the war on your mind. And then today we've got the book that Zach just held up the great divorce by CS Lewis. And I'm going to be dropping a link to a quick form. You can drop your name and your email address in if you'd like to enter to win. And then we'll be picking those names next week. We want to invite you to tune in with us again next week. We're going to be speaking with Carl. He's going to be sharing about the book, simple church by Thomas Rayner. Um, really looking forward to that. Uh, we hope you guys have a great week and don't forget to enter the, the uh, giveaway to win the book. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.